So how many of you have never heard that story before? You know, this is a little bit of a risque sermon today, just letting you know. I'm taking a little risk today, right? But that's what we're trying to learn how to do, is how to take risks. Because the truth is, we come from a family, a faith family, whose DNA is all about risk taking. It's not about sitting secure and content. It's about stepping beyond those places of contentment and ease and taking a risk for the things that matter. So we started talking about Abraham and Sarah a few weeks ago. And as we spoke with one another about Abraham and Sarah, we noticed how even in their advanced age, Abraham and Sarah took the risk, not because they needed to, but because they were invited by God to do so, to leave everything they knew and travel to a place that they still didn't know, but that they trusted God would show them. That's the beginning of our family line in faith, Abraham and Sarah. A little later in Genesis, we read about Noah, who was another risk taker, building a boat in the middle of land where no water was anywhere close by, risking the ridicule of all of his neighbors, but trusting that the invitation God had placed upon him was one he needed to take. And so he risked. There are lots of other stories between Noah and Tamar that I could also have told, but I don't have enough weeks in the summer to tell all of the risk-taking stories. So I thought I'd try to pull out a few that might not be as familiar or as comfortable <laughs> as some of the others are. In our Monday morning Bible study, we've looked at this story with the ladies from the community. And it was a very interesting conversation. <laughs> because it describes a number of things that are very outside our experience. There are aspects of Jewish law that come into play in this story that, that some of us are utterly unfamiliar with and certainly not a part of our own expectations for relationships. This story is also challenging because it is filled with a level of moral ambiguity that in many ways reflects our reality more than we might want to admit. For too often in the church we get comfortable with black and white categories of right and wrong when the reality is most of us live in that gray area a whole lot of the time. Buscando como andar en medio de lo blanco y lo negro y lo gris que está completamente mezclado. So I want to tell the story of Tamar and one of the reasons I pulled her out is because she's one of Jesus' abuelitas. In Matthew's genealogy, starting from Adam and going all the way up to Mary and Joseph, there are five women named. Tamar is one of them. She is Jesus' abuelita. And I can just imagine Mary and Joseph sitting with their son and saying, oh, son, you have to hear about Abuelita Tamar. <laughs> oh my God, what a story that is, right? And so here we go, family. We're going to look at the story of Tamar. So Tamar was the wife of Judah's first son, Ur. Judah, just to connect the dots a little bit, Judah is one of Jacob's sons. So it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then he has a bunch of kids, a bunch of sons. Judah is one of those. Joseph is another one. 
Joseph, the one with the Technicolor dream coat. Joseph, the one who was sold into slavery by his brothers because he was a dreamer and he was kind of his dad's favorite of all 12. Well, Judah is the brother who decides that it would be better not to kill him, but to sell him as a slave. <laughs> so it's a little better than, you know, let's kill him. I hate this kid. No, let's just sell him as a slave and then we'll be rid of him. At least we won't be guilty of murder, right? <laughs> murdering fratricide, murdering our brother. So that's who Judah is. And Judah, as he, as he ages, Judah, Judah finds, a, finds a wife and his wife has three sons, Ur and Onan and Shelah. And Ur marries Tamar. But for reasons we don't really know anything about, Ur is a wicked character, according to God, and, uh, and he dies. So, in comes this very unusual piece of Hebrew law. From Deuteronomy 25, verse 5. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, without an heir, his widow must not marry outside the family. Rather, her husband's brother must take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of the brother-in-law, which means to impregnate her so that she can have an heir. Now that's kind of weird, isn't it? From our vantage point. Es un poco raro ese reglamento que exige del cuñado casarse con la viuda de su hermano. And yet, it was a provision that was intended to help guarantee that each family would have an heir within that family line to whom property could be passed along. You see, women could not inherit anything. Women were the property of their husbands or their fathers. They had no right to inherit land. They had no right no legal right, they couldn't bring a, 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 a case before the judges of the land. Their words were not reliable in a court of law. And so the place of the woman was very precarious. And her only protection was to have a man in her life. Either a father, a husband, or a son who could advocate for her because she could not speak for herself in the public arena. So Tamar is given a second husband, the brother of her first husband, Onan. But Onan, Onan is like, I don't, I don't want to give her a kid because that creates more heirs that compete with the inheritance from dad. I, so I, I'll do the job, <laughs> but I'm not going to get her pregnant. And so he very craftily avoids impregnating her. Well, God doesn't like that. <laughs> and so Onan dies. So two down, one to go. Dos muertos, uno vivo todavía. Well, Judah's job, Judah's responsibility is to give his third son to Tamar. But he doesn't want to because she's a black widow, right? She's like going to kill them all. <laughs> and so, and so instead, of, instead of giving Selah to her, he says, you know, he's a little young still. Why don't we wait a while and you can go live with your father in the meantime. Entonces, la envía para vivir con su, con su papá mientras el niño crece un poco. Y so Tamar se va con su familia, la familia de su papá. So Tamar's over there with her father's family and she's all dressed as a widow. And so, you know, she is under the care of her dad for this time. Well, time passes. We don't know how long, but time passes. Evidently, Salah has grown up and is marryable now, but Judah doesn't ever send him along in his responsibility to provide an heir for this woman and for his first son. 
And Tamar realizes Judas coming. The cheese may, you know, it's just like here. <laughs> right? Corrió el chisme, Tamar sabe que Judá viene y que todavía el niño, de que el niño ya creció y que él no lo ha enviado, entonces uh, Judá está mal frente a la ley, pero ella quiere tener un hijo. She's insistent that she wants an heir for her family line. So she takes a risk, a big risk. She takes off her widow's garb and she puts on the clothes of a hooker. And she sits beside the road near one of the temples presenting herself as a temple prostitute in hopes of trapping Judah. And she does. Yeah. Along comes Judah. Ahí viene Judá caminando y, <laughs> y mira al lado de la calle esta mujer bien bonita pero velada para que no sepa quién es y sin reconocer que es su nuera without recognizing her as his daughter-in-law he's like hey babe how about it and she's like, hey, babe, what are you going to give me? And he says, well, how about a cabrito? And she's like, all right, let's do it. But why don't you give me something as a guarantee that you're going to send me the cabrito? Because, you know, you could walk away from here, and then I'm like, SOL. So, uh, so, so he says, how about this? What do you want? And she says, well, how about that nice little uh, emblem that you have and your, and your staff? Because she knows that those two items, everybody connects to him. It's his, like a family crest thing, I imagine. We don't really know exactly what it is, but some kind of emblem that exemplifies the family. And, and his staff, which he's always got, right? And so she takes these two things, and she lies with him, and she gets pregnant, and he takes off to go get the cabrito, and he sends the cabrito back, not himself, but with a messenger, right? You don't want to be too obvious about what you've done. So uh, he sends the cabrito back, and, and he's looking, asking around the village. He doesn't find her. ¿Dónde está, tam, uh, ¿dónde está la prostituta que, que estuvo aquí con, con, uh, cerca del templo? Y el pueblo dice, ¿cuál prostituta? No hay prostituta acá. There's not anyone around here who does that. And so he returns to Judah and he says, sorry, couldn't find her. And Judah's like, ah, let her have that stuff. But mark my words, I was good to my promise. I sent the goat, even if she didn't get it. So I'm good with the law, right? I haven't, I haven't harmed anybody. I've done everything according to what I said I would do. Well, pasa el tiempo. Y se descubre en la casa del padre de Tamar que Tamar anda en cinta. She's pregnant. PG. And nobody knows who. But they do know she's been andando en la calle. Because that's the only way that happens, right? <laughs> so. So dad sends word to Judah. Hey, guy. I'm really sorry to tell you this, but Tamar has gotten herself pregnant out of wedlock, and, uh, and she's, she's done a bad thing. And Judah immediately is like, burn her! Kill her! Because the law required that. That's the risk she took. She took, she risked her life. She bet her life on this little trick, so to speak. And so they go to get her and bring her out to be burned. 
and she says, um, one minute, I have a couple things I want to get. And she brings out the seal and the stick. El sello y el bastón de Judá. And she says, the one who got me pregnant is the owner of these. Anybody know who they belong to? <laughs> and Judah is just smacked in the face with his own irresponsibility, with his own selfishness, with his own violation of the law. And he says, rightly, she is more righteous than I am. For I should have given her my son, but I did not. And her life is spared. ¿Qué arriesgona? I mean, think about that. She was astute, aware of the law, aware of her position, aware of her limitations, but aware of her capacity. And she took a great risk that ended up granting her not just one, but two boys, two heirs. Two men who could then help care for her as she grew into age. The fact that she had twins is a sign of blessing. God blessed her prostitution of herself. Think about that. Because when we in the church want to draw such clear black and white lines about right and wrong behavior, we so often do it without really, really understanding the place from which people come. When we want to draw such black and white lines as a nation about what legal and illegal entry into this country is and isn't, and blame people who flee conditions in their countries that are intolerable for themselves and their children, they come to save themselves and they choose to risk breaking the law to save their lives, just like Tamar. When kids in impoverished communities make choices that are not laudable, but make choices to, to sell drugs to have some resources, or even to become prostitutes to survive, it's not because they grew up wanting that. It's because they felt, in most cases, like they didn't really have a whole lot of other options. Right or wrong, that's usually how they feel. And then there are kids who just grow up within the culture of those behaviors and never really know anything different. It's not always so black and white. I just want to say that. It's not always so easy to judge. And often when we do, as Judah did, that judgment is going to come right around and bite you in the butt someday. So as we look at the risk takers that are part of our family line, let's remember Jesus' abuelita the prostitute who slept with her father-in-law in order to save her family's future and become one in the line that brought to Israel the Messiah. Wow. If that's not mind-boggling and black and white disrupting, I don't know what is. <laughs> God invites us 
to take risks. Now that doesn't mean I want you all going out and dressing like prostitutes and making money for the church. No, it's not. Please don't hear that message because that's not what I'm saying today. But what I am saying is that God invites us to take risks. And that's part of our DNA as people of faith. And we shouldn't be afraid because God is there to hold us up. Let us pray. Gracias, Señor, por los cuentos y historias de este texto sagrado que, que nos recuerdan más de novelas que de, de cosas sagradas. Ayúdanos a descubrir aún en ellas que toda la vida te pertenece y que no hay nada en la vida que no puedes usar. Y concédenos la gracia de poder tomar riesgos como nuestros antepasados los han tomado para poder cumplir nuestro deber como hijos e hijas tuyos y tuyas aquí para bendecir como hemos sido bendecidos. En el nombre de Cristo, nuestro Salvador, te lo pedimos. Amén.